Hopefully now you're seeing my PowerPoint slides. So I'll walk through these. This will be our foundation for today's uh, workshop. But then, as I said, throughout the presentation, we'll be hands-on doing searches within a variety of corpora. So starting here. So I just wanted to introduce myself briefly, some of the work I do. As Tony mentioned, my research interest, my teaching interest has been in the development, the creation, the design, the evaluation of corpora and corpus activities for pedagogical purposes. That has led me to uh, investigations of business writing, legal writing, student writing, environmental writing, a lot of different spaces, but I always enter those spaces with the ultimate goal of informing pedagogy in a meaningful way. And whether that is directly in the classroom or indirectly through, through resources. One area that has particularly interested me is how we may use corpus study in the classroom to heighten rhetorical awareness. I think we often think of corpus study as focused on vocabulary learning, grammar learning, and we think of those in isolation, but I think we're missing a lot of the potential of corpus study. I see a hand being raised. Let me see if I can see what that question may be. I don't see a question. Maybe that was from the earlier moment. So, sorry, I'll, I'll toggle back to the screen share. So, as I said, I'm interested in developing, assessing um, corpora and corpus activities. So that's me. I hope throughout this session, I hope uh, that I can learn more about you, some of your experiences with corpora. So please feel free in, in a in a few moments, I'll ask for you to just quickly, briefly post your experiences using corpora as a language teacher or as a language learner. Before we jump into things, I'm assuming there are a range of corpus literacies present today. Some of you have likely used corpora extensively, completed searches. I certainly hope this session will be positive and beneficial and a learning experience for you but also to those who are perhaps more unfamiliar with, with corpus approaches to language teaching and learning. I hope when you finish this session today that you can really visualize what a corpus activity looks like, how you would implement that, what that really, you know, if, I, if you were to walk into a classroom and see a corpus activity, you could, you could recognize it. And I think often we hear you know, corpus activities do this, and corpus study is great for this, but sometimes I think we're missing uh, concrete illustrations to help people see what people uh, do with corpora, how to do so. Um, again, I, I keep getting a message from a Q&A, but I don't see any. Uh, I don't mean to ignore any questions, but I am going to toggle back Apologies to a, a missed question. It may have been from earlier. Again, okay, sorry, going back. As Tony said, I've made, uh, the publisher has kindly made my book available at a huge discount for uh, viewers today, for participants. I don't enjoy self-promotion, but if there is ever a place to self-promote, I suppose this is it, because certainly, we're here to talk about how to implement corpus approaches in the classroom, and that's exactly the goal of my book and the aim of my text. Now, I wrote that book, as I said, or as I noted earlier, because I felt there was a, a need for clear illustrations, clear demonstrations of how corpus activities look in the classroom. So if you want to buy the book, fantastic. I hope you'll find it useful. So the agenda for today, um, we will focus first on just some experiences, some background. I will offer a, a brief case uh, for corpus aided pedagogy. I want, and, you know, I know this is not a research talk. I'm not going to go on for long in this period, 
but I do want to set the foundation, provide some grounding for the activities to follow. And then I, I will describe some recent developments that are perhaps giving some momentum to, to corpus activities, to the adoption of corpus activities in the classroom. We'll go through lots of activities. Some of those we'll work through, some of those we'll, we'll just discuss. We'll build a specialized corpus. Um, I'll, I'll share a specialized corpus with you, hopefully. Uh, we'll talk about activity design, share some tips, and then we'll have a Q&A. So if people in the thread would like to take a moment to share your experiences with, I, I'm going to come back to a question posed by my Maizaki in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to toggle to the chat screen and I hope you will now post some of your experiences with corpus aided learning in the stream while I share some of my background using corpora in the classroom. So please feel free to share quickly to that answer. Yes, to that question. Yes, absolutely. Corpora can be used for, for revision. And I'll talk about that. We'll have some activities to display how that would look. Um, most of the activities I will present today were activities that I created in response to learner needs within a first year writing class environment at US universities. So for many years, I taught composition classes, writing classes in that first year uh, sequence. And so in response to certain learner needs, uh, whether that was an individual or more general as a class, I would create these activities and implement them in a variety of ways, whether that was in a lab, uh, in the classroom as a take home assignment. So most of the activities you'll see today were directly produced in class for learners. And some of them are modifications uh, of those, some of those original prompts and then some new directions that I think corpus aided pedagogy uh, can move and can explore beneficially. So seeing some of the experiences here using corpora, to train international postdocs. Uh, so definitely some advanced writers at that level, building specialized corpora to teach students. Uh, okay, for the study of hedges and boosters and academic book reviews. Um, okay, so using it, so the software can be daunting, but I wish I knew a gentle introduction exercise. I hope I give you the, that today. Uh, I use Sketch Engine. Great, great. We'll talk about Sketch Engine as well. Um, so wonderful. It's, it's great to see such varied experiences. I hope I can save this chat and read them all at the end because I'm fascinated and interested to see all of the many ways that people are implementing corpus activities. Are they, are they directly hands-on doing it in the lab, in the class? Are they producing handouts? How is it happening out there? in the world. So it's really exciting. We use AntConf, we use Lanksbox, okay, we've been using Coca. All right, fantastic, fantastic. I'm going to toggle back to the to the presentation screen, to the slides. So as I said, I want to make a brief case. Uh, I use the corpus search uh, query for a synonym search. So brief, concise, uh, short, I suppose those would all be useful synonyms for what I'm trying to, to achieve. Uh, as I said, I, I, won't spend, I, won't, I will not spend too much time here. Uh, I'm not going to detail uh, all of the studies about the use of corpus aided pedagogy for vocabulary learning, for collocation learning, for grammar learning, such as Bolton, Chan and Liu, uh, Huang and Liao, Li, Varley, right? I'm not gonna tell you about all the studies that show the affordance of corpus study for vocabulary learning. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you about all of the studies 
that show how corpus learning or corpus study can be used for error correction and revision. Chambers, 2005, 2007, Lou and John, Lou and Liao, many of those. I'm not gonna talk about all of the many, 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 many studies uh, that talk of how we can teach rhetorical functions uh, through corpus study, rhetorical awareness raising, the development of pragmatic competence. I, I suppose I just told you that was sort of the, my, my clever intent there. There is an, a, a growing, an increasing body of research in corpus aided language learning and teaching that continues to produce uh, positive, encouraging results displaying the efficacy of corpus aided approaches in the classroom. But specifically today, I'm going to talk about two studies. One study is Bolton and Cobb 2017, and this is a meta analysis. So Bolton and Cobb collected you know, scores of studies that uh, evaluate corpus activities in the classroom, corpus study in the classroom. And one of their first observations is they clearly see uh, the emergence, the growth of research within data-driven learning, within, within corpus-aided learning. So research in this area is absolutely increasing. And though their original pool was approximately 200 studies, that, that only included quantitative research. That didn't include research published in languages other in, than English. So the, the body of research on corpus-aided pedagogy is certainly growing. Now, some key findings from their study. So hands-on use appears to be more effective than printed materials. So certainly there's value in providing printed materials of corpus data for students. I think often this is done for technological practical reasons. I don't have a computer lab. I think sometimes it's done because it's perceived to be easier for students. But here we're seeing that hands-on corpus use is, is indeed effective. It seems that specialized corpora are more effective than the use of large uh, public corpora. Corpus study is effective for graduate students and undergraduates, intermediate learners as well as advanced learners, for general purposes learning as well as specific purposes, but particularly for vocabulary and lexical grammar. So in their conclusion or in their final comments, they say, they assert, so where it has been implemented and evaluated, corpus aided pedagogy works, right? So where it's been tested, it works. The second study I'll briefly discuss is Flowerdew and Chin. Uh, sorry, I think it's Chin and Flowerdew, a 2018 study. And in this study, they collect 37 research articles that focus on the use of corpora within EAP and academic writing context. And again, encouraging findings, increased use of specialized corpora, use of more corpora to account for a variety of learner needs. They're seeing more cor concordance tools available and being used. And so again, and they state again, there's no longer a question of viability. Let's go further. We, we see now that it's viable. Let's push. Let's see where it can be further implemented, what context, under what conditions. So, I think those are important developments within corpus pedagogy, but as the Chin and Flowerdew article notes, they are, part of these developments are the result of technological advances, uh, improvement in resources. So if you had used the corpus of contemporary American English, the COCA, 10 years ago, the interface in some ways, it was the same as it is now. It looks the same, it has the same color schema, but it has undoubtedly improved, become more user-friendly, become more learner-friendly. So, you know, th that's an important way that corpora have advanced, is that they're more accessible, they're more intuitive. Similarly, they're more pedagogically focused, learner-focused uh, corpora available. Some of you mentioned scale, Sketch Engine for English Language Learners. That's a fantastic research resource that, as the acronym indicates, is designed specifically for learners. 
flax corpus that we'll look at later for the study of collocations. A word and phrase, which was this separate corpus tool, is now embedded within English corpora. And then importantly, they're, they're more ready-made resources for learners and teachers. And in, in the past, there were many books, there were many uh, publications that extolled the many virtues, you know, told us all of the many great reasons why we should be using corpus activities in our classroom. But I felt sometimes didn't show us how to do that. Books are starting to do that more and more. My book is one example. Eric Friginal's recent book is another example with some fantastic lesson plans at the end that can be applied and adapted. There's a new book coming out with TESOL Press in the spring, uh, edited by Van der Viana. Uh, it's called New Ways of Teaching with Corpora. So there, there are more of these resources where you can just grab off the shelf, ready to go activities. So that's pushing against this idea that, oh, I want to use corpus study in my classroom, but it takes so much time. I have to design the activity. That early critique, or actually it's been somewhat consistent, I think that critique is fading because now there are more of these resources. So as a recent article in TESOL uh, Journal stated, you know, are we reaching the tipping point? Are we there? So are we to this turning point? Are we a boiling point, a tipping point? Whatever term you want to use, we've, we've amassed a body of research. The, the number of tools have proliferated and increased amazingly, I would say. Tools that are available are more user-friendly. They just look nicer. They look more friendly. They look more uh, inviting. I think those are all important developments. I'll use this moment to, to pause. Uh, if someone would like to post a question to the Q&A or in the chat, uh, that's the end of my brief case for why corpus study should be used or could be used. Um, so if, if you want to ask a question or comment on that before we move into some of the activities. What's the title of the study? The tipping point. Uh, I think it's actually, titled, are we reaching a tipping point? Uh, it's 2017 from Huang, H-U-A-N-G, and that is in TESOL Journal. Could you say again the name of the book, author with lesson plans? Yeah, Eric Friginal, and that's F-R-I-G-I-N-A-L, Eric Friginal. Let me see, other questions? Right, Corpus Linguistics for English Teachers. Thank you for sharing, Odin. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see. Let me check the Q&A. Uh, I was wondering, corpus-based activities for error correction. Mentioned that earlier, but yes, absolutely. Great research in this area on how you can, you know, identify errors in a particular learner or within a group and then design activities as interventions. Which tool do I use the most? In my teaching, I use the Corpus of Contemporary American English quite frequently. Uh, I love AntConc, free, easy, intuitive corpus search tool. Those are probably my, my favorite. I think Scale is great, but I, I just generally use Coca. Uh, that's, that's where I've started and maybe I'm stubborn, but I'm, I'm a loyal Coca user. Um, would you consider it a course, a corpora in a course of written translation? Absolutely. You should check out Parallel Corpora, uh, see some of those resources. I think corpora can absolutely be implemented in meaningful, beneficial ways within translation courses. I agree, scale is great. Yes, we're on the same. Yeah, scale is great. Uh, let's see, prefer online or offline? I, I do both. It depends on the students. It depends on what I'm trying to achieve. 
I like to give the students the data. I like for them to be hands-on with the searches, but there are times where I don't want everyone to take out their computer and log in. I can just provide a handout. I can provide the data and we can move on. Because again, what I'm trying to, to argue in a sense is that corpus learning should be a complement, should be a supplement. I'm not saying overhaul existing language teaching pedagogy. I believe we can find so many ways that existing approaches are compatible with corpus study. And so whether that's online or offline, I think that's a, a decision to me, be made by the teacher in the moment and for that purpose. Uh, sketch engine is good for parallel corpora. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Differences between corpora for reading and writing and teaching and learning languages. Are there differences between corpora reading and writing and teaching? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. Now, definitely COCA, the corpus of contemporary American English, has those different sub-registers where you can compare academic to spoken, uh, magazines to fiction. So it, you, if you do want to target uh, speaking, you can certainly do so. But if you want to target writing in a particular domain, you can do that as well. Uh, okay, I'm going to check out of the Q&A. Oh, how do we get more teachers to adopt corpora? I don't know, but I'm working on it. I've made videos. I've written the book. It's, it's definitely, you know, promoting it. And I think providing ready-made activities, making it easily, easy to implement those first few times, giving teachers the tools in what is a tremendously busy teaching day, you're teaching multiple classes, to have a ready-made, off-the-shelf, I can implement this today. I think having those resources increasingly available. I think that is a critical part of having more teachers adopt Corpora. Okay, I see some questions in the, in the stream that are being answered. Um, if you don't do the upgrade, you're limited. Uh, sorry, yes, there are some limitations with searches. Is the upgrade necessary? I think you get 15 or 20 searches free every day. Uh, if you think you're going to exceed that, then I suppose an upgrade. Automatic error tagging? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, oh, and thank you, Anub. Thank you, Anub, for sharing the, has corpus-based instruction reached a tipping point? Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna toggle back. Actually, before I do so, let me share some links with you. Okay, yeah, so you should have just received some links in the chat stream uh, that we're gonna be using. You are absolutely encouraged and welcome to complete these searches as we move along. Some searches we'll complete and discuss, others we'll just discuss and move on, uh, but please feel free to do as many searches as you like. Okay, sharing, sharing the screen once more. I, I'm gonna share directly to uh, the, the corpus. Okay, so here we are. Hopefully you are logged in and present in EnglishCorpora.org. Here's our landing page. We're going to go first to the iWeb, the intelligent web-based corpus, a massive, massive corpus of web, web language. So iWeb, as many of you are likely aware, is a newer, a newer corpus. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time highlighting all of the functions of the corpora. It seems that many of you were likely attended Mark Davies' session earlier in the summer or at other sessions where he's, he's done this or you've used it on your own. Uh, you know, but I do want to just set a foundation of some keywords and primary search techniques uh, and give you some options. So I'll move through this somewhat, somewhat quickly. 
Um, okay, so here we are at the iWeb corpus. Um, you, you, the list function is clearly the, the simplest, easiest function to, to produce. I'm going to do a search of adjectives that modify uh, the noun phrase study. So notice how I have, I have adjective in the first slot, followed by study, and then the part of speech tag for common singular noun. I think these sorts of simple studies even can provide useful information on right, collocations for academic writers. How do academic writers frequently um, modify and talk about their studies as a, as a window into what's important for that community? New study, recent study, further study, independent study. So we see many, many possibilities there that can guide learners. Uh, we could just go to the next. This is likely the most powerful learner corpus tool av available. I'm just going to the word search, see detailed information, and you're presented with a, a wealth of information. Uh, you can see the word used in video, you can have it um, pronounced topics where it's used, co common collocates here on the right, the synonyms. So a great deal of information is made available to you here. Similarly, you can go to browse, uh, just search for, uh, I'll use study again as a noun quickly. Uh, let's look at it, just its noun use. Oh, I didn't click verb, that's okay. So here we see, uh, information for, for study. Let me see this Q&A question. How are the topic, topics defined? I believe the topics are what are the, the main words, the sort of keywords, not in the collocational window of study or not in the collocational window of your word, but what are the most frequent words on the web pages when that word is used? Right, so a, a different way of thinking about it than collocations. So study like occurs often on pages, on web pages that also discuss researcher, student, research, patient. Uh, some of those words appear also as collocates, but it gives us a sense of the, the aboutness. What is this page about? In what context does study occur? That's how topics is, is used here. So going back to that original search screen, right? We can see the list, collocates. We could do, you know, collocate searches here, of course. Uh, moving through some of these more basic searches, I want to highlight the tremendous value, uh, the capability of building specialized corpora now within iWeb and COCA. So here you can see some specialized corpora that I've created over time. Climate change, coffee, DIY. I have frequent, I've recently moved and I'm you know, building and doing projects in my new home. So I, I created a DIY corpus, engineering. So for example, now I can search specifically, let me reset. That is a useful tip just to keep in mind uh, Sometimes it is helpful to click uh, reset between searches. I'm going to do grounds as a noun phrase. So um, certainly that would be common in um, discussions of coffee. So we add the grounds, top with the grounds, your grounds. So just an easy search to show, right, once I've out of this 14 billion word mega corpus, I've narrowed more specifically to my own specialized corpus. Uh, I think there's another Q&A question. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. All right, so, so that's the, the iWeb corpus interface. Hopefully you've had opportunities previously to explore this site, so I, I'm not gonna spend you know, much time going through the various searches, but I just want to comment once more that 
the iWeb corpus, I think, is a perfect demonstration of what is hopefully uh, a tipping point that we're approaching, right? It is such a powerful tool, user-friendly tool, pedagogically focused tool for language learners to use. And remember, on that first search, we saw we could access videos where the word is used. We can get pronunciations, translations, clusters, collocations, synonyms, definitions. Wow, that's, that's a really tremendous uh, capability. I'm going to move now to the corpus of contemporary American English. Very similar, again, not gonna go through all of those, but the key distinction with the, with the COCA is that I can now search by specific registers. This is particularly useful in perhaps a writing classroom where you're trying to make decisions of formality. Uh, is this word use informal? Is it formal? This type of search comparing registers I find to be quite useful within writing classes to help address these questions of formality. Again, you can build your own corpora here. Uh, I created recently a small corpus that includes every mention of the word animal within children's literature, uh, biology within academic registers, every site in the business register that mentions investors. So there's some interesting ways and interesting potential uh, for creating quick specialized corpora. Now, five years ago, this wasn't so readily available and building your own specialized corpus could be a tedious time consuming process. Still a quite beneficial one and we'll still talk about the benefits of that later, but this certainly eases the the workload of creating your own corpus. Okay, so that's a brief, brief introduction to, to the interface. And now I'm going to toggle, we're gonna to move into the next few sections of, the, of this workshop. The first one is going to specifically focus on corpus searches and some activities for vocabulary development. Then we'll move to corpus searches more appropriate maybe for a writing classroom and then finally for speaking and listening and something I call just cultural inquiry. Now, I do want to make the note however that those categorizations um, I don't want them to create this idea in your brain that you know corpus searches can only be developed for these certain skills um, or that Corpus searches are somehow individual uh, for only for analytic individuals or const, you know, constrained to a particular type of student. I think the affordances for corpus aided instruction are, are broad. And you know, many of these activities that I present, for example, in a vocabulary development section, could absolutely be prompts in a speaking and listening section. So I don't want to my category system that's just an organizational strategy to constrain your thinking on how you might adapt and implement these. Let's see what the Q&A, what are the best resources for specialized corpora? We'll get there, we'll get there later in the session. I have several slides on creating specialized corpora. As I just noted though, Corpus of Contemporary American English and the iWeb Corpus allow you to easily, quickly, make your own specialized corpus. All right, thanks for the question. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the original slides. Okay. Okay, so corpus searches for vocabulary development. Lots of possibilities here. The corpus is clearly quite powerful in its ability to provide content for vocabulary learners, right? We could do searches that focus on learning words with the same endings. So for example, in the business corpus that I created, or in a business writing corpus, let's find words that all end with I-Z-E. Realize, optimize, operationalize, 
those are uniquely business, right? Operationalize, optimize. Uh, so that could be a useful word list if you are targeting uh, an English for specific purposes, English for business purpose type learner. Word endings, uh, nouns ending with T-I-O-N in an academic register such as biology. Again, nominals and nominalizations are really important in academic writing. It allows you to pack a lot of information into your sentence structure. So helping an academic writer within biology or engineering, whatever field it may be, create a word list of nouns that end in T-I-O-N for their purposes, that could be similarly useful. Words beginning with trans, transfer, transition, uh, transformation, right? So I did creating lists around certain roots, um, other ideas, descriptive adjectives, uh, adjective plus research, adjective plus study. I know those seem like rather simple, mundane searches, but I think they're really important for helping learners see how a particular discourse community talks about the things that are really important to them. Like certainly study, certainly research, those are important words within academia. So, you know, new study, innovative study, right? What, what are the, what's really value, right? What are the common collocations? I think can be quite interesting as, you know, certainly vocabulary development, but also a broader discussion of what does this mean that, uh, you know, the top 10 collocations with, uh, within, you know, academic writing with research are innovative, new, um, you know, all of these sort of forward-looking type adjectives. Uh, lima searches. So a lima search is when you put brackets around a word, for example, the verb take. So bracket, take, bracket, then you can see all of its many forms, take, takes, took, taken, that can be useful. Again, studying synonyms. Um, how can I use, uh, instead of saying new study or just study, doing a synonym search. So I'll, so a synonym search, uh, I will, I'll just show you one quickly. Let me toggle, toggle once more. So a, a synonym search within the COCA is quite, quite easy, right? So here I'm doing a synonym, synonym search for synonyms of new used with study or I'll just simplify things just to clearly demonstrate synonyms of new within the COCA, uh, another different, recent, further. Not all of those are great options, but uh, you can get a sense of how a synonym search could be useful. Um, those are, you know, ideas that can be adapted into uh, activity, activity certainly. Um, I do want to show you though, the word and phrase dot info used to be a separate site. You know, it, the, the underlying structure of it was based on the same corpus as the COCA, the same text, uh, but it was separate. And maybe they weren't getting a lot of traffic at that separate place. So now it's embedded here. So you notice in the top bar, you have this analyzed text entry. And then when you click it, so quite powerfully, you can copy and paste your own text. A student could copy and paste their own text into this. I'm just going to copy an academic text, right? Here's a randomly generated academic text from foreign affairs, right? So you can see the text here, search. And now we get all of this information about the words, right? Yellow words are, you know, so the yellow and green are different frequency profiles. So how could this be used in a classroom? Well, if your language, if your student is working on an essay and maybe they've They've gotten their idea, they've written a draft, but now they're polishing and improving. How about copying the, the essay into here, looking at the vocabulary, looking for places where 
they could enhance their vocabulary use through you know better vocabulary selection okay so i'm going to toggle back to the my slides because i want you to see some of the activities so here is a prompt oh sorry i need to hit share okay so here is a prompt for for example that i've written for students to you know use apply within a classroom um, given to students to complete for homework so here's think of a word you have encountered recently so as noted many of my examples emerge from an academic writing context for eap learners so many of these prompts as you'll notice are more slightly focused in that direction now certainly think of a word you have encountered recently in a movie in a tv show in a song right these can be easily adapted by simply choosing new words uh, for the activity so choose a word make a list of five collocates that you think so i think that's an important one like i think it's one of the great affordances of corpus study is that it allows us to test our own intuitions right so I, you know what are my intuitions what do i feel uh, what do I think about research? How is research modified? So I'll, I'll make that list, those five, and then I can go to the iWeb. Or I guess for this search, probably be better to go to the COCA and then do a search within academic writing. What are the words that most frequently appear? What word classes? Uh, you know, is your list, your original list, different than the, the new list? Do any of the results surprise you? And so I think this next bullet point, I hope is a sort of value, a possibility. Now, I think those first two steps, maybe we think of often with a corpus activity, but now let's take those findings and transfer them and move them into a, a whole language activity. So I've got my data, I've done some investigation, and now I can speak and discuss, you know, I can report the findings, I could give a brief presentation to my class for a minute, I could post to a discussion forum. So now I'm facilitating a conversation, facilitating a classroom discussion on this language issue. So if you're a student in that class, now you get to hear what, 10, 15 reports on different words, their use, their collocations, so it gives everybody a chance to, to do some investigation, have some discovery, but then move on to sharing production. I think too often we think of corpus activities as a, a lonely endeavor of people, something that people do at home alone on their computer. It's individual, it's analytic. That doesn't have to be the case. There are tremendous possibilities for making corpus searches, group work, pair work, whole class work, a lot of opportunities available there. Near synonyms is another search that I've written. Again, this emerges from a student need. Uh, synonyms are not so uh, synonymous all of the time, right? So uh, I present, I'll, I'll give you the example on the next slide, but you know, let's take two words, major and chief. Uh, um powerful and strong beautiful and attractive synonyms that feel the same feel interchangeable but are is that true largely broadly right is it true that these words are actually uh synonyms so let's take our let's choose two near synonyms let's in you know think about and reflect on what words we think will be used most frequently with them and then do some searches to find you know, what word is indeed used and then make a guideline. This point three that I want to emphasize, make a guideline. I am extremely cautious not to allow corpus study to become a new prescriptivism. I don't want to tell a learner like, oh, you didn't use it the exact number of times in the corpus or in this exact way. Therefore, wrong, 
I, I, I don't want corpus study, as I said, to become a new form, a new prescriptivist, a uh, rule-based system. I want corpus study to be empowering to provide students with choice. So this is why I write, make a guideline, like a guideline that will inform your writing, a guideline that will inform your language use. I, I, I don't say, I don't use the word, let's make a rule to follow. Let's make a rule that will shape our writing. I want to avoid that sort of language and be more, you know, empowering with my word choice. Like, let's make a guideline that you as a language user can reflect upon and then can deploy as you wish, right? So I, I want to be empowering. So I always speak in guidelines, 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 and you will rarely, almost never hear me say rules, rules, rules. Um, and I, again, that's one of the, I think, the values of corpus study. Let's do the investigation, let's see the data, let's interpret it, and then let's, let's make a guideline. What does this mean for our language use? Okay. Uh, this slide just shows an example. This is beautiful on one side, attractive on the other. Seemingly interchangeable synonyms but that's simply not true, right? Those are not interchangeable. Uh, language users use them in very unique contexts, right? So beautiful day, beautiful mind, beautiful eyes, beautiful song, attractive options and alternatives and candidates. So it would be, would create some dissonance if you said beautiful candidate, beautiful option, beautiful force. Those would seem, um, you know, let, they're simply less common, right? So that shows you how a near synonym search could be implemented. Uh, again, uh, on the next one, target words. Uh, we've completed this search. Uh, you could search for research as a noun and discover how researchers discuss their own and others' researches, research. Alternatively, you could choose a frequent noun used in business writing, such as investor or report and investigate the common adjectives which are used to describe it. So again, this is simply designed to help students explore language use in their target domain, whether they are in engineering or business, humanities, whatever their area of study is, you can, they can craft searches that are you know, individual and empowering and push them towards you know, becoming members of that community, help them sort of talk the talk, right? Text analysis. I, I briefly, I, I showed this to you recent, just a moment ago with word and phrase. So again, you could ask students within a reading class, ask students within, you know, a writing class to upload a text. Huh? potentially their own writing, but upload a text that they've been asked to read, use that activity to study new words within the text, learn unfamiliar words, see how words are, are used differently, different collocations. And again, I think it has to be, there has to be that final step of sharing, reporting, discussing, you know, transferring it from an individual search to a whole class or small class, small group discussion. So implementing the activities, just some tips. Yeah, ideally, I suppose it would be best if we all had access to computer labs where our students could do these searches. That's not always available and even when it is available, I find it inconvenient, right? I'm meeting with a class Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here, but now we have to go to a computer lab. I need to get everybody registered and logged in. Sometimes moving to a lab can be difficult. Great if you can. Great if your classroom has computers. Group activities in class, I think are, I think are generally more effective. Um, students are able to use their own computers. They can partner with a friend quite easily. Generally, labs feel distant, right? You can't really see people. It's hard to circle around and get in a group. But if you can do it in your classroom, 
with even one computer per group, two, you know, or with a pair, it, it allows more social interaction. So that's one reason why I like and encourage more of in-class, you know, small group use of with laptops. It kind of facilitates more interaction. You can certainly do these as homework prompts, sending them home for students for to do the searches and write, you know, write response papers, write response paragraphs, post to forums. So there's write-ups and reflections. Uh, short videos, discussion forums. There are a lot of ways that you can use the Corpus Search as a platform into a variety of activities to, you know, advance all language skills, right? So it's not, again, the point being, you know, Corpus study is not for one, one skill, certainly suitable for all. And a point that I've made once or twice and want to you know, emphasize again, that corpus aided learning does not have to be a, a lonely endeavor, right? We can certainly facilitate pair work, small group uh, discussion forums. We can, we, there are certainly things we can do to create more interaction. Okay, so that's just some ideas and activities for corpus searches for vocabulary. I'll pause for a moment, give you a moment, give you a second. If you want to ask any questions or if you have any ideas you wish to share here, I'll open up the Q&A. Okay, a good corpus for academic work in British English. Well, there's the BNC, the British National Corpus. There's also the BAWE, British Academic Writing. I'm not sure what the last, but it's available through the FLAX corpus. Uh, we're going to use that later, but the FLAX, I believe, allows you to search the B, the BAW. I, I don't know if people say the BAW corpus, the B-A-W-E corpus. Is it possible then to build a corpus of different learning digital objects, videos, text, and others for reading? Yes, I, I've never done this, right? But there's certainly corpora available. There's a, if you're familiar with TED Talks, there's a TED Talks corpus where you can see the video on top with the transcript at the bottom. You can search for a word and then find all of the TED Talks where the word occurs. So that's one really useful example. I've seen a corpus of political speeches that has a similar idea. If you search for a key word that politicians are using, you can get videos of them using the word in different contexts. Uh, again, I haven't built a multimodal corpora as a corpus as you discuss, um, but I believe those tools are are definitely available. And like I said, there's some such as the TED corpus that you know I think is doing what you're what you're doing. So I, I would suggest go find the TEDx corpus and see if they're doing what you what you imagine. I think okay would be best in terminology. Um, okay, Vincent, uh, the BAWE is also available on Sketch Engine. Okay, great. Frax, Flax don't really use it legally. Ah, okay, okay, good to know, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the Q&A, but I should look over at the chat room also, see what is there. Okay, here's another comment about the BAWE. Yes, computer labs are like that. Yeah, it can just be difficult to have interaction in a computer lab. Most computer labs have these just rows and students just focus on their screen in front of them, generally don't interact. It seems every time I try to move a class of students to the computer lab, like we're all gonna meet there at one o'clock, be ready. You know, they have to, it's a new building, they're finding a new room, they, you know, it, just inevitably, it, it seems we get started a little more slowly. It doesn't take off the way I would like. Okay, Nair, I know Nair, hi Nair. Oh, Mark, note that POS tags. Okay, so BNC uses clause five. Okay, whereas English corpora, oh, I lost the comment. English corpora use clause seven, okay. All right, other, where can I find the TED Talks corpus, please? 
oh man, I don't, I don't have a link immediately available. Maybe someone else out there can do a quick search. TED Corpus, TEDx Corpus, I forget what it's called exactly. What type of COCA academic license do you have in your lab? I'm fortunate that my department, my university has the academic license that allows users on our campus unlimited searches. So that's, that's tremendous. I'm very grateful. It's a fantastic resource. Um, if you can do it, you know, you can have your university, your institution subscribe. That's, that would be, it's fantastic. Okay. Some students cannot cognitively process lines of concordances. Fair point. I think for those students at maybe a lower proficiency level, you can modify concordance lines. Um, you know, copy some of those concordance lines for the target word into a document. Maybe take out some of the complex grammar structures. You know, try to retain the authenticity, the heart of it, but you can make some minor modifications to still, still show that word in context. But I do think that's a, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. Okay. Sketch Engine is free for all EU students. B-A-W-E and B-N-C are there. Okay. Okay. I'm going to toggle back and we'll look at some corpus searches. Again, these are designed more for an EAP writing type classroom. Any final question in the Q&A? Most of the hands-on activities are taught inductively. Is it a possible? Great question, great question. We will, we'll, I'm going to get to that point because I, I, I do think it's important. Ah, let's just talk about it now. I do think it's important to toggle and switch between those approaches. I think with in the early stages as you're implementing corpus activities in the class, you probably want to give them, give the students the data, give them the interpretation, give them a guideline, right? And that can be, that can help them see the process. And then I think later, as you move from, okay, now the students feel comfortable doing the searches, they've done a few searches, they've seen how this works, then you can start transition into more approaches that allow them to search for those patterns uh, to make their own conclusions. Uh, and, and I have some of those, I, I, I believe that sort of toggle between, because I think you're absolutely right that let's not do all inductive, let's not do all deductive. Let's try to you know, create learning experiences that you know, capture both groups of learners, uh, learners that kind of want that variation or need that variation. Okay, great question, Olfa. Thank you. Yeah, let's let's toggle between those. Hands on, giving the rules. I'm sorry, providing guidelines, and then as they grow more comfortable, then let them free to start to find the patterns on their own. Okay. TED search engine or so. Okay, closing that one. I'm going to toggle back to the to the slides then. Oh, okay. So again, as I, oh, sorry, one moment. Okay, so another writing activity emerging from uh, what seemed to me to be a very common pattern within student writing in my composition courses. Students quite frequently using conjunctions and and but to start sentences. Um, I think generally academic writing avoids that. I'm, I'm not saying strictly, it, you can certainly find it, but I do think it's common for language teachers or writing teachers to say, no, 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 don't do that. Don't start sentences with conjunctions. Conjunctions, right, they coordinate, they connect these clauses, don't start. So, Let's test it. Let's test that claim from, from our teacher, right? Let's, let's be autonomous learners and let's see what we should do. So here's a search, here's a prompt designed to do just that. So you can visualize with this activity that I've given this to a student who is likely doing this quite frequently. Like I actually recall one student in particular that within 
an introductory paragraph to an essay started, you know, five of eight sentences with a conjunction. There's a place for a conjunction to start a sentence, probably not five of eight sentences in an introductory paragraph. So completing such a search as I've outlined here in the COCA, click the chart. You, know, you, can, you can search with punctuation in, in the COCA, so period, space, and, repeating with but. You know, the chart function shows you, you, know, you can see the table, see the layout, the bar graph, a frequency in the different registers, spoken, academic, fiction, magazines. And so you can see where, where a feature or where a pattern is most frequent. And you'll find from doing this search that and and but are not frequently used to start sentences in academic writing. Now again, I avoid that word of rule, but as a guideline, I think that this moment, you know, this student hopefully did the search and had a bit of a, an insight and an awakening like, oh, wow, I do that a lot. I probably shouldn't do that so frequently, right? So hopefully from there, they can create a guideline with some teacher intervention in those first stages, but hopefully, you know, as a semester, as a class progresses and students gain more ability and comfort with the corpora, that they can reach that guideline on their own and then write it. I'm going to avoid using conjunctions in my academic writing. And then you can imagine them sharing that guideline on a discussion forum for your class in a brief group discussion in class. Right? Now we've got 15 people all with a new, you know, maybe this guideline, other students are generating other guidelines for other features. And we create this community of uh, data driven guidelines to inform our writing processes. Okay, moving on to a next slide. Oh, wrong one. Again, addressing this, uh, back to my comments earlier, speaking of informality, formality, you know, helping writers make choices that are appropriate for the register. You know, writing teachers, as I've written in this prompt, writing teachers often make comments that say too informal, be more academic. Okay, maybe sometimes, not all the times, maybe sometimes what they're referencing is frequent use of phrasal verbs. And maybe there are two, a, a lot of phrasal verbs in your writing. Uh, so let's test our phrasal verbs informal. Are they frequently used in academic writing? And if, you know, if they're not, so as I use here, figure out. Figure out if that's more informal, what can I choose instead of figure out? How can I then do a synonym search for other words? So if you, were to go to the Corpus of Contemporary American English, COCA, you did this chart search with figure out, then you did another chart search with the near synonym, determine, with discover, with observe, you'll see clearly, and I think you could develop your own guideline that would likely lead you to think, wow, that one word synonym, discover, feels now more formal, more appropriate, more academic than the phrasal verb figure out. Okay, maybe that's just figure out. Maybe that's not true for all phrasal verbs. But let's test it, keep testing, keep testing. So again, now students are presented with um, you know, this information. They can reach a guideline that then they can test and test and test. And hopefully again, that will inform, inform their writing. Well, obviously, English has many, 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 many phrasal verbs that are quite commonly used. But let's just see, are they used as much in academic writing? Seeing some Q&A questions coming in, let me click on those. Uh, how does one do a chart search? Just in the COCA, right at that top bar, you have list. And then the next one, I believe, is chart. Um, oh. Yeah, so it's list and then chart. So when you enter the word in the chart, for, dear Robert, can we get the slides for reference? Yeah, I'll make those available 
Uh, if you want to email me, that's fine. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll definitely try to make those available in some form, either through Tony uh, or through my own personal website. Uh, how do you suggest researching whether this awareness is actually activated? Fantastic question. And, you know, there's certainly research, you can certainly find studies that, you know, test sort of interventions and prompts such as this. Now, it's certainly a tricky uh, endeavor to try to, you know, measure learning gains over time. I've done work on um, early studies of, uh, you know, college, using concordance lines for, for vocabulary learning, collocation learning. So there's definitely a breadth of research. I would go to that Bolton and Cobb 2017 meta-analysis that I previously mentioned, and their article lists 64 studies that do this empirically, that answer your question of how this is done. So certainly encourage you to find that article and you know, grab other pieces that they reference and see how they're doing so. Okay. Okay, great, great. Uh, I think I'm still sharing. I'm gonna close that for the moment. Uh, phrasal verbs to linking adverbials. Uh, again, this is probably one, this search would probably come further along in the term as they're understanding how to formulate their own guidelines, linking adverbials. However, therefore, they can be a bit complex to properly punctuate generally three different patterns for how they how they are done so you know punctuated grammatically uh, so do some searches can we work out some patterns so I, I've provided some a sample student response to find these patterns so you can say okay so if I use however to begin a sentence it must be followed by a comma if I use it to combine independent clauses so you know, maybe this is a more complex activity uh, with a student that's more familiar with using corpora. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think this is another uh, useful one. Using scale. Okay, we've had some some fans of scale out there, so I will flip over to scale for a moment. And if you're not familiar, I'll let you see it. Okay. So here we are on scale. Uh, let's see, what search can I do? Uh, I maybe I'll, I'll do significant again. That will be fine. Oh. You know, as the name suggests, scale for English uh, language learners, it is a it's a good example of an accessible, intuitive, friendly uh, tool. All right. While I think the COCA interface has, is increasingly intuitive and very user friendly, you know, if that feels, if that seems maybe a bit much, a bit too intense for the learners in your setting, maybe something like scale would be more appropriate. Here, these, uh, here we have, uh, some simpler concordance lines. A second significant issue is climate change. All right, so uh, a bit less complex here. Uh, the, the prompt that I write asks students to describe the word sketch. So the word sketch information is you know, similar to some of the in-depth word information we saw for iWeb, uh, providing a a lot of information. iWeb has more information with the videos and the pronunciations, uh, the topics, etc. But scale is a nice, accessible, uh, informative um, info package as well. So we see words with property, with the properties of significant difference, uh, modifiers, nouns. So again, we'll you know, do some searches. Students can again write and post a report post to class discussion forums, make a short video using VoiceThread, present the information in class in a small group or to a peer or to the whole class. Maybe you have your students create a vocabulary journal and this becomes an entry in a vocabulary journal. So again, Scale is a really great resource. 
a resource, the similar words is nice. Uh, so yeah, certainly if you're not familiar with scale, uh, that can be for the person earlier who worried that COCA concordance lines may be cognitively overwhelming, maybe scale would be a, a good place to, to start your students. Um, moving to the next, oh, I'll, I'll slide back. Actually, I'll just go directly to, to FLATS. Um, FLATS is similar to scale, I suppose, in some ways. I do think it's uh, learner friendly again. I, I'll just do the same word significant, sorry. My, but you can see here some of the different corpora that are used. I thought in the past they had the BAWE, but maybe it's no longer allowed per, you know, one of the earlier comments. So here we have significant in academic English and social sciences. So again, uh, perhaps a, a simpler presentation than even scale, where we get some reduced patterns adverb plus significant significant plus noun um, i i don't didn't include any activities specifically designed for flats today but basically all of the activities previously presented could be uh, adjusted using uh using flax do just going back to the flax page for a moment i will draw your attention to their activities you can design your own collocation word games here, collocation guessing games. So this can be a nice space to, um, you know, direct your students to learn some collocation. You can create the exercise and then distribute it. Uh, then your students can, can use it. Okay, I will go back to the slides for a moment. And again, I'm often interested in expanding the ways we generally think of using corpora, uh, using a corpus in the classroom. Um, I think all of the sample, many of the samples I've likely shown, you know, are accessible, make sense to you, uh, you would anticipate. I hope this other example, one that I've used positively, uh, is a new sort of way of applying a corpus search. Uh, and it's using the now corpus uh, for student research projects. So it can, uh, some interesting conversations can be facilitated through this, can help have conversations of how to evaluate what are good sources, what are maybe not so great sources. But if we go back, um, I'll go to, let me share a new screen, sorry. Okay, so hopefully now you're seeing the corpus of contemporary American English. I'm gonna exit out of the COCA and go to the now. So you'll notice with the now core 11 billion words, it's updated, it was updated yesterday. Amazing, right? So super, super current, go to the now corpus. So perhaps your student you know, are investigating, writing a paper on some current issue. Uh, try to think of, you know, pipeline. I'm interested in environmental issues. So what are the recent articles in US media that have discussed pipeline? Could you do this through a Google search? Sure, I think this is equally effective and it's differently useful. I think it can be quite, quite helpful. So find matching strings, pipeline. Okay, I'm gonna click through again. And so now we can see all of the articles where this occurred. Now, some of these instances of pipeline are it's more metaphorical use, but here we have one from the Wall Street Journal at number 18, that's specifically speaking of a particular pipeline. And so if you click on that, you're actually taken to the article in the Wall Street Journal so students could use this now corpus as a first step into a research project, right? I'm interested in 
animal extinction. I'm interested in the wildfires in the American West. I'm interested in uh, health care. Whatever the issue might be, searching for in the now corpus could help students quickly find uh, research, or not, not research articles, but uh, news, news on the web uh, that would you know, help them just develop their knowledge base on the topic before they write further. Uh, they can create a reference page for those, so it gives them some practice creating citations, so some opportunities, opportunities there. Okay, so that's the end of part two and uh, the section on, on writing. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll pause once more for some questions and then we'll move on to another section. So I'm gonna pause the sharing and open up the, the chat. All right, any questions on, now it's from 20 countries and not just the US. Okay, so you can compare countries as well. Thank you, thank you, Mark, right? So now has some unique capabilities, right? Uh, that some unique affordances, and I think it can be usefully applied in these research projects to help students read about certain topics, find news articles on certain topics. You can see some of those pipeline articles that will maybe grab, if you click through, you can think, That's, I don't know if I trust this, I don't know if I, right? So if you can give a, a an activity on evaluation. Let's see. Could you search youthquake and see the word was used frequently by newspapers from India to Australia? Maybe Mark could answer that question, but I suppose you could. Yeah, I mean, Mark is saying here that you can compare uh, not just the US. So I suppose you could look for youthquake in the now corpus, but also the globe corpus. Um, yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, could you please show slide eight again? Oh, that maybe was a long time ago. What, what was slide eight? Uh, I have slide eight is just saying questions and comments. So um, other questions, other questions? Professor Bull, you can send your slide. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, Claudia, I'll, I'll send my slides to you, sure. Coca is great. I've been using it for 10 years, but right now all these corpora are absolutely fantastic. Hello, Natalia from Ukraine. I know Natalia. We met at a conference in, in Denmark. Hi, Natalia. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Let me look at the Q&A. Can we get the slides? Yes, you can get the slides. Okay, sorry, the slide for Corpus Activity 8. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So that's the, the scale activity. I'll, I'll share that and then we'll, we'll carry on. Okay, so yeah, please provide links to slides. Yes, 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 lots of interest in making the slides available. I will absolutely do so. It'll happen, we'll do it. Okay, let me, what am I doing? I'm showing slide eight. Let me toggle back to slide eight. Okay, there we go, that's slide eight. Can we get links to share it at the beginning? Yeah. Okay, getting those links for you. Hopefully you got those. I'll post them. Let me go to the chat uh, as well. Okay, posted them into the chat also. Does the use of wrong collocation lead to misunderstanding while speaking with native speakers? I think it certainly can. You know, the example that I gave of beautiful and attractive, I don't think necessarily that meaning would be impeded. I think people would still understand, but it may cause a brief pause, a sort of hiccup in the conversation. Uh, so I, I think it can. So I think in some cases, 
absolutely choosing, I don't want to say wrong, you know, less frequent, uncommon collocation could impede uh, and obstruct conversation. Absolutely. I do think that's, that's true. Certainly. Links are in the Q&A section. Cool. Okay. Okay. So if no more questions there, then I'll toggle, toggle back to the last part, or not, not the last part, but uh, the next section. Uh, yeah, please. Um, we're saying share some other activities. That'd be great. I, I'd love to see those. My, my email, repool at ua.edu. I, I would love to have a conversation, collaboration, continue this conversation uh, beyond. Okay, let me, let me toggle back to the slides. Where are we? So, you know, we've, we've moved through the, like the, the primary domains, I suppose we could call them of corpus searches. We would anticipate, you know, corpus searches for vocabulary, corpus searches for writing, certainly, certainly. Uh, area that really interests me and excites me is how we can use corpus searches as platforms into cultural inquiry platforms into discussion and conversation and intercultural communication. So I think there are unique affordances here in this space on how we can do so. Just as a, you know, a corpus activity isn't, again, as I'll say, uh, it isn't just for the writing class. It isn't only for the grammar class. It isn't only for vocabulary development. It certainly has potential in a lot of spaces uh, for a lot of purposes. So I hope this, this section, Corpus Searches for Cultural Inquiry and Discussion, will sort of further highlight that. So what do I mean? What are some examples? So can we look at diachronic change? So just saying, can I look at the way a word has changed over time or the way a word has been modified? So maybe in the 50s and 60s and 70s, certain adjectives were used with a noun but now more recently, those adjectives are changing. What might that say about culture, cultural shifts? Uh, that can, you know, I, I do think that data is relevant and insightful, and it can lead to some interesting conversations. I'll give you some samples in a moment. How are certain word modified? What can that tell us? Again, so maybe not looking at change over time, but like right now in American discourse or British discourse, Right, right now in an American language use, how are certain words modified and discussed broadly? That can be really interesting conversation. Who possesses what? I know that seems kind of vague. I don't want to tip uh, my hat just yet. I, I, I'm going to save that, but generally, as the question suggests, who, who possesses what? And I'll just save the rest for the moment. Uh, changes in naming, well, global warming to climate change, vegetarianism, you know, can we compare different terms and their differing frequencies, differing uses? What can we say there? And then changing representations. Again, thinking of how are words discussed differently? How are constructs, how are ideas such as immigration, speaking specifically of the U.S. context, how is immigration, the way it's been discussed, changed over time? That, you know, that search, can we can we can start to answer that with a corpus. That could be really interesting classroom conversation. So Google Ingram Viewer, uh, I shared that link with you. Um, it's sort of simple and straightforward. Certainly, certainly does not provide the depth of information that COCA or iWeb or his Corpus of Historical American English certainly doesn't provide you that depth. But for certain applications, for seeing trends over time, sort of clearly, immediately visible, uh, the Google Ingram corpus can be quite cool. Uh, I will toggle over the, the screen sharing to, to the Google Ingram corpus. So if you want to move to the Google, if you search Google Ingram viewer. Okay, so here's the homepage. Uh, 
So you can see this trend uh, quite clearly. Um, Frankenstein, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but let's do some different ones. So again, thinking of cultural inquiry, what might certain searches show us? I'll do teenager, teenagers. Let's see what we get. Uh, okay, so we have interesting, you know, we're thinking World War II, 1940s, suddenly in American discourse, we see the growth of this term teenager. Like it's not even present before. You know, what does that say about American culture in the 50s and 60s of an increasingly mobile society, greater independence, emergent individualism, perhaps this young group of people that before did not need to be named. Now it's like, oh man, these teenage, right? We, we needed this word. So we see its emergence. And then interestingly, we start to see its decline. So what's going on there? I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a hypothesis for that recent shift. Uh, but you, know, you can think of all sorts of words. I'll do selfie. Uh, you know, unsurprisingly, rather recent, rather sharp increase. Uh, but you could prompt your students to think of a variety. What was the word earlier? Youthquake. I wonder if youthquake will be here. Ah, here we have some youthquake. So, um, you know, you can have your students think of certain keywords, cultural keywords that might be of interest, uh, and then do some explorations. I sometimes use Google Ingram Viewer as just fun, getting class started, uh, sort of icebreaker things, right? So in the US, Halloween is approaching. So zombies, ghosts, goblins. All right, so ghost, zombies more recent. So again, just lighthearted, fun uh, language observations. And often what I'll do is I'll couple an initial search in the Ingram viewer with a follow-up search, a more in-depth search uh, in the, either in iWeb or COCA, or, or I guess more appropriately in this case might be the corpus of historical American English. So let's see the trend here and then go dig a bit more deeply elsewhere. Okay, I am going to toggle again, back to the slides. Okay. What happened to global warming? Um, so uh, this, I have a full write-up and lesson plan with readings, et cetera, uh, on this question or idea in, in the new TESOL Press book, New Ways of Teaching with Corpora, right? So you, know, you can look at the, uh, as I somewhat summarize it here, right? The famous documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore uses global warming, global warming, global warming. But that word has just seemed to fall out of favor in US discourse. And now it's all climate change, climate change, climate change. So there are a lot of, there's some different ideas for why that may have been, why that happened. Some suggest that it was, uh, conspiracy is the right word necessarily, but climate change maybe seems less dramatic, less scary. We know climate things change? Does that feel less dramatic? Uh, maybe so. Um, so we can compare, again, going to the COCA, going to, you know, I think that's the corpus that I suggest here. Yeah, the COCA. And so let's see, you know, you, you can, using the chart function, you can track it over time and see there was a period where global warming was preferred and climate change was rare. And then those flipped. And now global warming, the trend is just uh, decline rapidly while climate change is, has grown. Now, it'll be interesting. You know, I'm increasingly hearing the, the phrasing or collocation, the bundle, uh, climate crisis. So maybe we can explore climate crisis. I'm seeing climate emergency. So let's kind of look at these different terms and what they might show about, uh, you know, and then you could compare what are, is American media discourse talking about climate change in the same way that Australia 
in the same way that you know, other English speaking news, news outlets are. So there are ways we can do these cross-cultural, cross-national comparisons that can be fun and interesting. Searches for vegan and veganism, vegetarianism, plant-based, organic. How are we seeing a shift in these conversations, these discussions? Um, so yeah, I, I, again, that's another possibility. Again, what I think is you know, valuable about this sort of activity as well, you know, imagine an EAP style speaking and listening, reading and writing class. This search provides a lot of data, easily interpretable data for students to, to write and to make statements about uh, data, right? So it perhaps scaffold them, scaffolds them and helps them prepare for more complex sort of data reporting activities that they'll have in the future, right? So this can be a good learning activity, you know, find the data, write a report, present the report, share your findings. You know, students can sort of feel themselves as academic, as academic, I'm doing research, I'm finding data, I'm interpreting data, I'm synthesizing, I'm reporting. So it provides a nice platform to facilitate a central critical academic task. So that's one reason why I really like this sort of activity and other activities is it allows us to to facilitate or you know help the learning, motivate the learning of a lot of different skills, but also help students kind of join, you know, if you're wanting to join academia and go into a university study in an English speaking country, this can this can be this type of activity I think can be helpful. Okay, moving to the next one, adjectives with man and woman. Um, another, this is more of a conversation starter. Uh, the findings often surprise students, but again, you can have some really interesting, engaging conversations. So maybe just in your brains now, you can think, what are the most common adjectives English speakers use to modify man and woman? And what's going to occur in that slot before each of those nouns? Uh, make your list for man, make your list for woman, go do the search. Well, how are those lists different? Uh, I think you can get some interesting insights into discourses around gender. Uh, you know, if you look at those lists, how are you know men are often described as you know old or tall. Women often get ascribed more uh, adjectives concerning appearance. So, oh man, we can really come to some interesting insights that we might use to critique language choice. Like this is problematic that we're using this class of adjectives most frequently to describe women, right? And then we can compare which adjectives are used most frequently to describe man and woman in your first language. Can we find some examples? Again, so we can have a really interesting dialogue on you know, language use that can reveal some cultural insights but in a sense, we also get to have a bit of critical discourse analysis and say, well, this is problematic. Let's push against this. I wasn't aware of this pattern and I don't like this practice. So what does this mean and what does this say? Like, I think we can have some really interesting and that your students are possibly reproducing these patterns are, you know, I'm just trying to say that I think it can be a really engaging, interesting conversation for you to facilitate in a classroom. A follow-up example of that, I had a student a few years ago do a really interesting study of uh, Jane Eyre and noting what certain characters owned, right? In the following genitives or following possessives, what were male characters and female characters differently able to own and possess? So, I, I'm stealing from that idea and thinking, well, within popular American discourse, are there differences between his, what's the noun after that, or then her and following that, right? So what do men and women own differently? Look at those lists, do that search. It's really surprising in a way. Maybe it's not surprising, but it's, it's definitely intriguing data. Uh, in the differences in those two. So 
you know, try, try that search sometime on your own. We're sort of running out of time to do searches together, but uh, again, interesting, interesting activities there. Exploring language change, challenging so-called norms. Um, immigration is a common topic in American political discourse. You know, the, it seems the preferred or most common, most frequent pair is illegal immigrant, right? So the illegal modifier followed immigrant. So it's, you know, the big reveal is illegal is a very recent uh, collocate with immigrant. It hasn't always been that case, right? So we can see over time that the word immigrant and immigra immigration have been modified differently. I think that's really interesting. It can push against certain notions that, well, language use is, well, is inherent or natural in some way. It can help students see the language change, make different choices, be empowered. So compare illegal immigrant and undocumented immigrant. Those have very different political ideological undertones and meanings. So let's compare some of these contentious terms in American discourse or British discourse, Australian discourse, whichever uh, setting feels most appropriate for your, your needs, uh, and investigating those investigating those changes. Again, I think we can have interesting conversations. We give students a platform to do research, to share findings, to formulate a hypothesis, to make statements. So again, I think these are useful platforms. Uh, and then again, just a, maybe a more lighthearted, fun uh, language classroom activity would just be what, I, I heard this word at the coffee shop. I heard it on campus. I heard it in a song. I heard it in a, in a movie. What does that mean? Yeet, woke. All right, so woke has taken on a new meaning within American discourse. So finding some samples, man spreading, hangry, uh, the goat, right? All of these, I would say somewhat, you know, rather new words that a student may encounter in you know, in popular media, let's just do some quick searches and, and investigate. Again, this can just, this is a more of a, maybe a more lighthearted, get class started, let's share some information on some new words. So uh, a different sort of activity. Okay, so we're approaching, well, we have tw 20 or so minutes left. I'm gonna push through the last sections and then try to leave the final 10 minutes for some dialogue and some questions and answers. Um, we've already seen how to build a specialized corpus within iWeb, within COCA. Such tremendous power to do so. You know, in the past, to create your specialized corpus, right, if you were teaching an English for specific purposes class, on a particular topic to you know, collect the text and organize them, right? That was a time consuming endeavor. Wow, I mean, this new capability, not necessarily new, but this now what COCA and iWeb makes available to us, as we saw in those early, that, that's simply fantastic. So they're easy to produce. I mean, you can do so in just moments. You can generate keyword lists for the particular domains. So you can really get to, these are the words that my students should be learning and encountering, uh, writing and speaking in this specific class, right? Can inform your materials design. So again, a lot of we're talking about direct, direct, uh, you know, teaching activities, but some of it is just for you as a teacher to see language use in a particular area uh, that you can inform your own teaching and then inform your, your, uh, your materials design, et cetera. So again, doing, creating those specialized corpora on, on those sites is, is just so simple. Now the, the second option though, is to create your own personal, local, I just mean local, I, it's unique to your students, to their needs. Uh, maybe you can do that through the COCA, 
through iWeb, but there will likely be situations where, you know what, I, I want a small corpus of student writing. I want a small corpus of, um, you know, conference abstracts because my students are, they're graduate student writers. How can I do these different things? So I know I asked you to download AntConc. I don't think we're going to have time to do that, but I'll still walk through these slides and, and discuss them. I think AntConc is quite user friendly. It's certainly the tool that I recommend most frequently for people who wish to build and analyze their own corpus. You know, there are other ones available that are great, such as Wordsmith. I also have to pay for Wordsmith. W Matrix, not free. Inconc, download it for free. Uh, Windows, Mac can be really great. So, so samples of possible specialized corpora, a corpus of student writing. I think this is quite powerful to provide relevant exemplars, relevant models for student learners. I don't know if Jack Hardy is out there, but Jack Hardy has a has an article talking about you know, relevant models and how those can be useful for student writers. So it's yeah, great to see those patterns in the COCA in the academic subregister, but maybe giving them similar patterns uh, within, you know, student writing from their very class, that model might be uh, more useful, more powerful for that student at the moment. Sometimes building that local corpus allows us to sometimes provide immediate, timely, relevant uh, information to a student at, at exactly the moment where they need it. Uh, so that's one of the powers of you know, having that small corpus. Again, corpus of articles from a particular discourse area, particular discipline, maybe it's conference abstracts, articles from a student paper, uh, le you know, letters to shareholders from businesses, you know, the you know many many options depending on what your setting what your classroom context is so i was going to walk us through ant conk um, maybe maybe we don't quite have time for that i apologize um, but I'll, I'll just kind of speak to it let me i'll open ant conk I, I suppose i can One moment. I'm going to force myself to end at 150 so that we certainly have 10 minutes to chat at the end. So we'll do what we can do uh, in that time. So this is AntConc. If you've downloaded and looked at AntConc before, uh, I'm going to open a directory. Um, uh, where did I, I have, I have some corpora that I've built over the years. Uh, a legal writing, let's do this legal writing mini corpus. I open it, you can see the files enter here. They're ready to be processed. First step, you have to go to this word list tab, hit start, and now you have it. And this is your first entry into all of the other searches that you can do. So now if I click bankruptcy, I can see all of the concordance lines for bankruptcy in this small corpus. Uh, I can see where it occurs in these texts. Uh, I, you know, I can do collocate searches. So here I can, I'll sort by, I'm gonna sort by frequency. So what are the most common collocates with bankruptcy? Of course, we have the court fraud petition. Okay, so we can, collocates, clusters, concordances. Now all of those things that we were doing in these other tools, now we can do them specifically uh, for, for our corpus, right? And you could easily share these files with your students so that they have access to the files and then you can do hands-on activities together. You might just build the, own, build the corpus of maybe student writing. You don't wanna share the student essays with students, but you have this small corpus and that helps you grab some useful samples when you're developing an activity. I will just load the keyword list to show you this quickly. Keyword can be quite powerful. It really helps you get to the heart of the matter, right? We saw in our word list, we had items like the and on, uh, those were quite high. Let's, let's get those out because we know those are going to be 
frequent everywhere in any any domain. Uh, where was I? Go back to corporate. Let's see. I hope you're following this. I, I it sort of opens a pop up. I don't know if you're seeing this pop up. You may not be. Uh, but what I did is I went to the settings, tool preferences, and there's keyword, keyword settings, and you can load a, a different corpus, right? So I've got this one small corpus of legal writing and then a much larger corpus of, of similar related legal writing. That's not the best comparison, but it, it does the job for what we want to do today. So here I've, I've stripped away, I've tossed out all of those, uh, sort of function words that we would see in any corpus and I'm getting directly to the words that are most frequent, uh, most important to this, to my main little mini corpus. So now we can see, okay, Valdez is important to this corpus. Even bankruptcy is more important. You know, it's, it's occurring at a higher frequency in this corpus of legal writing and then this other larger corpus. So again, I compare legal writing to legal writing that probably wasn't the best decision. Might be more useful to compare. You know, it is good to compare to something similar, related, maybe a bit larger. You know, sometimes my comparison, I, I, I've bought the, the down and downloaded COCA for myself. So I might compare to the COCA. Uh, so that's just another possibility. So again, you might wish to share this information to students uh, or give them the files. Uh, I've done it both ways. I think like a 2016 study or so on rich, raising rhetorical awareness. I built that corp, those corpora. I just gave the students the data, the handouts uh, in that study. They never actually did any corpus searches. So we can do both ways depending on our setting. Okay, I'm gonna use these last few minutes just to hit a few final points and then we'll save the last uh, moments for discussion. Steps to building, just you know, find find the files online. That I would recommend finding easily accessible files. Collect them, save them, convert them to TXT files. If you want to tag your files for part of speech in the same way or similar to Coca and iWeb, uh, tag Ant. It's another. It's on the same site as AntConc. Uh, collect, collect, collect. Do you think you have a nice sample? Um, then go for it. So DIY corpus design. So you've built a corpus. How do you transfer that into an activity? Well, think of those learner needs. What patterns are you noting in their writing? What things do you think would be useful for them to learn? What do you want them to achieve in the activity? So identify learner needs. This is your basic needs analysis. What do they need? What do I wish for them to achieve? What's the research question? Um, you know, what do you what do you want? sort of what linking adverbials are most frequent. So creating a question that can shape the activity, find a corpus or build one, do the searches, analyze the data, create the activity lesson and materials, and then modify as necessary. That sounds like a lot, I, I get it, but a corpus, you don't need millions and millions of words necessarily, right? Uh, you can start small, build over time, once you've got the corpus built to a satisfactory size, of who's to say what's really satisfactory? Once you've got enough text there, then you can start trying to develop just some small activities. So I'll close just with some tips for doing corpus activities in the classroom. Model, model, model. Show, show students yourself doing, you know, you doing searches, let them see the process. Uh, this relates to that second item of making it a regular feature of class. I don't think it can be tremendously successful. You do a training and then maybe six weeks later you do an activity and then a couple weeks later. Like, try to incorporate it or make it a regular feature. I think then the affordances can be more fully realized. And again, trying to push away from this notion that corpus study must be individual be whole class activities, small groups, pairs. As I've said, don't love doing these activities in a lab. I prefer to do it in a classroom. Students open their laptop 
can roll their desk or pull their desk next to each other, do the searches together, have a conversation. No, even just figuring out how to do the search. What's the search syntax to get the data, discussing it, et cetera. Um, it's, I suggest balancing generic, right? These are just generic searches that I think everyone in the class can do and benefit from. But then also sometimes like, can I create some targeted prompts for particular learners, particular needs? Uh, you know, sorry for the self-promotion, but maybe some of those prompts available in my book, you could sort of have those almost on file and just, you know, type them up for students. Like, why don't you go do this search? Go do this one, go do this one. So have some generic ones, but try to give some targeted ones too, because that targeted search is gonna hit the student right when they need that information. Start with group discovery. Let's all go to the same place and get the same finding together. And then we can go discover our own patterns uh, later. No lab, no problem. You can print out these handouts, do it in class. Adapt ready-made materials. I, as I said, Friginol's lesson plans are fantastic. I hope you like my plans and my text. I think the ones that are gonna come out in Van der Vianna's book are gonna be excellent. Look at those, maybe they work perfectly for your context. Certainly you can tweak them for your setting and then build a local corpus. Not in one day, but over time. Just start collecting some essays here and there so that, or whatever text it may be, so that you can have those on file. Okay.